Recording in progress. Here we go. Uh, about one minute into my starting speech, we're going to do it again, guys, because uh, I didn't hit the record button. What's up, everybody? Got a big crew here, a uh, good crew from all over the world, some cool towns, some cool places, and uh, we're going to get after it. We're going to take a look at what's going on in the markets. Uh, first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about market regimes, why they're important, and what we do with that information. Uh, then we're going to take that information and we're going to um, look at what market regime we're currently in right now and how to best trade that environment. Then we're going to take a look at a full market review, just scan through everything in a very quick manner. You'll see why I like to have things organized, in, uh, organized by market regimes. So you can really determine, is there something to do or do I just do nothing? Um, and if I want to do something, this is, you know, we do this. Um, and then we're going to uh, take a look at the current trading system I'm using to trade this market environment right now. Uh, we'll talk about prop trading. We'll talk about having a trading plan. And, you know, any uh, Q&A you guys want to do, we can, we can go as long as you want, as long as people are uh, asking questions and engaging and, and uh, joining in. We're happy to, uh, happy to, I mean, we could run this into next week if you guys want. <laughs> Probably not. I have road trip Friday, guys. Come on. So let's, um, let's get started. Let me have a sip of water. Wash down this cafe. Okay. We're going to start with the S&P 500, the big daddy. We're just going to take a look. Actually, let's, let's put this into context. Let's take a look at the S&P 500 on the, the weekly basis and get an understanding of where we are and what's happening. Now, I'm going to use a couple of tools here. The reason I use them, not because they're they are able to, uh, not because they're witchcraft, not because they can read uh, the future, not because they're anything uh, very special. I'm just going to, a big part of the way I trade is I'm here to trade the other traders. What are the other traders doing? I'm looking to play their, play against their game. One thing, one thing you need to know, and I, I write about this a lot, is that most traders, like something like 90%, 95%, depending on who you talk to, of traders don't make money. So if you think about that, I mean, if you made $1 this year, if you ended up the year up $1, that's better than most traders. Uh, and, you know, like the top 1% of traders can make hundreds of thousands, millions, 10, 20, $100 million. You know, Stevie Cohen's a fantastic day trader billionaire. Um, there is a lot of, there's a lot of really, really good traders out. Actually, there's a small amount of really, really good traders out there. And there's a massive amount of traders that don't know what the heck's going on. So what I do is I want to be playing against the majority of traders, not playing against the best traders. So one thing that is very simple is to just find what everybody is going to be paying attention to. And, you know, you don't, and I'll show you what I mean here in a minute, what everybody has been paying attention to. And the secret is, is not to, is not to uh, act right away when something happens. You wait for the reaction to the action. So if I say like, uh, you know, there's a, I don't know, like a, the, the golden cross, right? I guess with a 50-day and the 200-day moving average, turn the 50-day turns above the 200-day or something like that, I think is what it is. Now, right away, people are just going to be, a lot, of, a lot of traders are going to be like, oh, I just, I got to get in. It's the, we're, we're, you know, it's the golden cross. I just got to get in. But what you would want to do is, okay, the golden cross, everybody's talking about the golden cross, CNBC's talking about the golden cross, blah, 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 golden cross, exciting. But what you'd want to be doing, what I do, is I wait to see how the reaction is to it. And typically, you have the initial reaction, and then you have a bit of a fade. 
And then you have the, the real follow through or the failure. So what I want to be doing is, okay, this happened. Now let's see what happens next. Okay. When something start, when it starts happening, the thing that you're looking for, when it starts happening next, okay, now I can start. Uh, now, I, now I can get in this game. Or if it doesn't happen, like you expect it to happen, like it doesn't, uh, you know, it doesn't break out, pull back and break out and run. Well, that's also giving you information. And most likely you're going to have a lot of participants in the market who are going to be overly positioned for the reversal that are going to get stopped out or something. So I'm not saying that the golden cross is anything special. It's just know that there are players out there, a lot of players who watch CNBC and, you know, are, are not as, um, they, they just react to things like that. They don't even know what it means. Uh, and so uh, what you're looking to do is play them. So another one of those is the Fibonacci's. Now I'm not, I'm not hating on Fibonacci and I'm not loving on Fibonacci. It's not the be all end all as far as I'm concerned. It, it just gives you context. And basically what it is, you take a range from the low to the high or from the high to the low, and then you measure the distance that the, the asset trades. So typically Fibonacci has a 38.2% retracement, a 50% retracement, or a 61.8% retracement. What they mean, you know, that's, that's your research to, to do. Uh, don't just trust people that tell you these things that tell you how important Fibonacci is and uh, or how worthless it is. It's it's yours to it's yours to learn. So don't just you don't just need to memorize what the Internet tells you the Fibonacci stuff is. You got to get out there and learn it on your own or just don't use it or use it in a way like I'm using it. And the way I use it is this is telling me that a number of people are going to be paying attention to these numbers. So from the COVID bottom to the uh, 2021 highs in, in December on the S&P 500, it has pulled back 38.2%. Some people think 38.2% represents strength. Some people think 50% is pretty solid, but if it goes 61.8, it's weaker, blah, blah, blah. I don't have an opinion like that. My belief is, well, if it's pulling back and 38.2% is there, there's going to be a lot of people who are going to see 38.2% and they're just going to buy. And that's what we saw on Friday. Last Friday, the market was selling off pretty hard. Uh, we were short all day. And then the, the exact level was about 3,800 on the S&P. And we, we got to 3,807.50 on the S&P futures. So we in, in the trading lab, we got trailed out of that. So we were short and we got, we exited on that because it was pretty obvious that you're, we were going to get a bounce somewhere. Also, another thing to keep in mind is it doesn't have to be precise and exact. In fact, oftentimes that's, that's what happens. So many people focus on it being precise and exact. Like it has to actually hit 3,800. It didn't hit 3,800 or 3,803 or 3,801 or whatever it is. It hit 3,807. So we still got that that to go. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's, it, it isn't that important. What we're looking for is price action around these inflection points, around places that, where there's a lot of uh, decision. And that's what we got here at this 3807, four points away from the, the actual uh, level. And we rallied 100 points that day. Uh, we've rallied another... Uh, so well over 200 points off the off those lows on the S&P. Okay, so that's the first bit of information. We expect that to happen. Now we drop our time frame down into a daily chart. And we have, so I'm going to take that Fibonacci off. Um, and what we have is we have a trend line. And the trend line connected the uh, April high, the May high, and another uh, swing high, these are uh, April swing high, May swing high, May swing high. And that trend line had been respected three times. And finally, we broke through it today. And we're breaking through, depending on which one you used, they, they both work. We broke through it today. And so far, we've been holding it. So what would be, what would be bearish here is we blast through this and it, it fails. Now, that doesn't mean that it's completely dead. 
That doesn't mean that the rally is completely over. Uh, it just means that the strength of this is there and too many people seem to be watching it. My, my, from my experience of watching uh, Twitter and, and talking to people over the last week or two, nobody expected this rally to um, do anything more than what it did the last couple of days. And, you know, maybe didn't even think it, they were coming into this week thinking that this was just going to continue to go down. So a lot of people are surprised that this is coming back. Now, I loved it because we had Friday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Tuesday and Wednesday were just these, Tuesday was a big reversal day. Opened up and sold off hard and then rallied right back into the close. That was first indication that there are legit buyers out there. And it wasn't just buyers from Friday. There are people who are willing to buy these things. And that happened on Tuesday. Yesterday, we had some FOMC news and that did nothing all day until the news was out. And then it rallied into the close. Mildly interesting, somewhat entertaining. But that continues to show strength. And then we that took us right into that trend line. And it yesterday, it failed to close outside that trend line. So you got more people bared up, um, ready to go. Today is supposed to be the biggest sell-off in history, according to this gentleman named Master Trader, um, <laughs> Logan JH1. Um, and, and, you know, I don't know, I don't know this guy, but, um, so he's got 25,000 followers. So it, here's, um, he basically said today is supposed to be black Thursday crash will show no mercy, uh, expecting it today. Okay, cool. Great. Um, the thing about no, and no offense to Logan, I don't know Logan. Um, but uh, what I do know is that, you know, there's, I don't trade that way. I don't trade that like, okay, I've, I've drawn two lines and now it's inevitable tomorrow. Um, I don't, uh, I want to trade the, I want to wait for the reaction, right? So let's say, let's say Mr. Uh, this, this master trader gentleman uh, is correct and it, it dumps. Well, I want to have a plan every day knowing what, you know, what I would do. So I'm currently long on the Russell right now. And if it is the, you know, Black Thursday or whatever is, as, uh, as had been speculated, um, well, I would be stopped out of the trade and I would probably flip short and write it down. Or if it's as, you know, death defying as it's, as it's intended or has been uh, expounded to be, I may, I probably wouldn't even trade. Uh, but so I want to be in a position where something like that happens. It doesn't take me out of the game. So another part of that is the risk management. What size of trades am I taking? So I'm in, uh, you know, a fairly small position long right now on Russell. Uh, oh, it's a satirical account. Oh, Greg, thank you for that. Um, yeah, I, uh, <laughs> Good, good for him. Um, okay, so makes me makes me feel better that because I posted in the Slack uh, as a uh, maybe I should have read his bio. <laughs> World's best trader in cash and mean reversal strategies. Rivals of Imani, master of trolling trolls. I don't know, master of trolling trolls. Cool. I, I agree. I agree, and it somehow showed up in my feed, and you know, I don't I don't even know if I follow the gentleman. Um, but uh, pretty, pretty, thanks for that, dude. Uh, good to know. Um, so you have a lot of people that are going to see that and believe that sort of stuff. They're going to see somebody with a 25,000 Twitter followers um, as, you know, like, oh, we're going to, you know, we have to, we have to do it here. This guy has a bunch of followers. He's got to be right. <laughs> um, but so what I have is a contingency plan. We made it to the 20 period moving average, which was something I was looking at all week. Uh, if you don't, um, the middle band here, the, this line here on the Bollinger bands is 20 period. And that, that's something that would have been expected to touch. And that's where we start thinking, okay, now we can start getting some weakness. Another thing, so we talked about the bounce off the, um, we talked, um, 
I'm going to have to refresh this real quick. Uh, we talked about the bounce off of the, uh, um, off of the Fibonacci ret uh, retracement level. That was something that a bunch of people were going to be paying attention to. Here's also something that people are going to be paying attention to. Okay. Now, I don't trade head and shoulder patterns, but uh, we have an inverted head and shoulders here. Boom, boom, boom. I guess here's our neckline. I don't, I don't know. Um, so a lot of people are going to be talking about the inverted head and shoulders. If you don't know what it means, it doesn't matter. Um, just know that there are people who, who are going to be seeing this as a rounded bottom reversal, as a, um, as a uh, uh, inverted head and shoulders, a number of things that people are going to be seeing here that are going to start to be bullish. Now, what that does is that brings a lot of people into the market and allows them to get hurt or make money. Doesn't, you know, there's so many people who are bared up right now. It's pretty easy to, um, it's pretty easy to know that this, the, the, past, uh, the path that is going to cause the most pain to the market is up and i'll tell you this because a lot of traders who uh you know who i saw over the last two years on twitter in in you know in our trading lab uh people just you know i talk to it's huge attrition a lot of people have been wiped out so let me just say right now for everybody here who's who's watching this live or the, the, you know, the, the playback, it, you know, if you're in this game right now, you're doing good. Even if you're losing money, even if you are, you know, having a tough time trying to, trying to get positioned and know what you're getting, you know, being in the right positions and everything like that. Even if you're having a tough time right now, you're doing good because this sort of market is something a lot of traders haven't experienced uh, you know, we haven't had anything like this since, since 2018, maybe 2015, uh, certainly 2012, 2011, 2010. Uh, you know, the COVID thing back in, in 2018 was completely different. So if you came in after COVID, then you've never really experienced a major crash, but you hear everybody talking about it. And if you came in uh, after 2018, you never really experienced, you know, a quarter long uh, drawdown of a year of, of complete chaos. If you haven't traded 2015, 2016, and 2012, and 2010, and all that, all those things. If you don't have that experience, and you know you came in and and you were like, man, it's easy to trade. It just goes down, and you buy it, and it goes up. Um, if you're sitting here right now, and that's and that's you, and you're still here right now, that's awesome. Uh, you know, for people who've been in the game for a while and you're still here right now, that's awesome too. But I want to give a little encouragement to the people who have, who are newer and experiencing things a little bit differently. It's, a, it's just a different environment right now. And what worked in, what worked in Q4 of 2021 doesn't work in 2022. That's obvious right now. And uh, so if you're here right now and you're, you're, you know, you're suffering, you're losing money, um, realize that you're a, a lot of your, a lot of the people have been washed out and, you know, they're, they're hurting. They, they don't want anything to do with trading. You know, they, uh, the money they, you know, maybe they, because what happened in Q4 of 2021, you know, last uh October, November, December was, was just wild. It was, it was a blast. I mean, we were making thousand percent gains on our, on our option trades to the upside. Cause you know, Apple was doing things Nvidia, Microsoft, Tesla, all those were doing that crazy wild move. It was very easy. And we had, you know, we were using the swing B strategy that really works in those sort of environments. But as always, we roll through different market regimes. And so what we have, let me don't this guy off. Um, what we have here is I have this tool I use, which is called the SQN. It's a free tool, free indicator on trading view. Just search out uh, SQN or Chris D macro on trading view. And, and I've put it up there for free. Um, what it measures is it measures, it's a lagging indicator 
And what it, what it measures is the, the market regime. It measures, uh, it measures what the, what the market currently uh, for the you know, recent has been doing. And yes, that's historical. And what's nice about this is if you know anything about me is I want context. I want to, I don't care. I don't, I don't need somebody to tell me exactly or an indicator to tell me exactly what's going to happen next because those indicators don't do that. Sometimes they do. Sometimes they don't. Um, but a cool thing about this is it's a lagging indicator. And most traders don't use lagging indicators. They don't like to know what happened in the past. They don't want to know any of that sort of information because if it, you know, you hear lagging indicator and you're like, dude, I don't care. I don't, I can see on the chart. It went up for, you know, the whole, the whole year. I get that. But what does that do for me now? Well, what the, what this tool does is it measures the last 100 trading days. And so it, and then it averages the change of those days. Okay. So if we're up one and a half percent yesterday and up, you know, uh, 1% today, averaged over the course of a hundred trades, you start, you can pick out direction and then you can see how volatile the daily changes are. So on this chart, you can see we've got four colors. We've got, uh, we've got like a yellow, uh, green, blue, red, and uh, crimson, dark red over here. Uh, so actually we have five colors. Uh, and you'll notice that it was so short time frame that it, it barely even registers. You rarely see the crimson. You can't even, I, honestly, it's hard to see it. Um, like you can see right, right here. Uh, it, it lasted for about a day or two. Um, so it's very, it's very uncommon for that. And that's the bear volatile regime. Uh, and so we have five different market types and I call them market regimes. Let me just do this. Um, and I'll break them down over here. We have Now, if you follow me enough, you know, you've heard me talking about market regimes a bit. Maybe you've done a course, a couple of course, one of my, you know, any of my courses, I'll be talking about market regimes at all times. Uh, if you're in the trading lab or if you just follow me on Twitter or my email, um, you'll hear me talking about market regimes. Now, let me give you a metaphor to what a market regime is and why they're important. Market regime is like a calendar and a map. If I knew the time of year and the location, if I knew the time of year and the location of, let's say, you know, AK here says, hey, Chris, let's meet up. Okay, it's right now the end of May. Uh, I would want to know where and probably, you know, when, like I'm sure we would probably assume it's fairly close that we're talking about. Uh, but the where would be super important. If he told me, hey, let's meet up in Miami. Okay, well, now, I, now I'm prepared with even more information. And you know why is that? Because if he would have said Montana, well, it could snow. In fact, this past weekend in Colorado, they got six inches of snow uh, just a, you know, a few days ago. So by him saying Miami... That tells me, ah, very clearly, I know the type of attire that I don't need. I don't need a winter coat. I don't need gloves. I don't need snow boots. I don't need a jacket. I don't need a sweater. I don't need, you know, hat. You know, what I probably need is a shirt like this, a pair of shorts like I'm wearing right now, um, you know, sunglasses and a swimsuit probably. I don't need, I don't need a lot. Um, now, if he said my, uh, Montana, okay, well, I'm definitely bringing, bringing, pants, boots, a jacket, um, probably a couple of layers. Cause it's, you know, it's may, but it's not like, it's not free. It could be freezing and it could snow, but it also could be 75, 85 degrees at the same time. So I need to have a lot more tools. So what the market regimes tell us is that the likelihood of what to happen. So it's, a frame of reference. You guys are familiar with the, the thing, you know, theory of relativity from Einstein. Well, what it says is, you know, 
what you're measuring, you need to compare it to, to what? What is it compared to? You know, the speed, how fast are we moving? Well, we're, you know, you could say, well, we're going 42 miles an hour. Okay. But that, you know, that just gives you an exact reading, but is it fast or is it slow? Well, compared to, uh, compared to how fast I can run for, you know, a minute straight, uh, flat out, it's, it's lightning fast <laughs> compared to how fast I can run a marathon in. It's, it's even faster compared to how fast 42 miles an hour compared to how fast, uh, Simon, I'm just going for the first names I see on the uh, list here. Um, I see Simon uh, on his bike, on his bicycle, on his Tour de France road bike there, um, blasting through England. Um, you know, 42 miles an hour might be kind of slow or just decent, right? And compare it to like a plaid Tesla uh, Model S or something like that, you know, 42 miles an hour is probably pretty slow. So compared to what is what this gives us? This gives us the bull quiet, bull volatile, or bull volatile, bull quiet, neutral, quiet, and volatile gives us the, uh, the ability to compare it to something else, okay? And so what we do is we create a, a, a number line, right? Zero is zero. Um, above it is here is neutral. I'll make these a little bigger. So you've got... Uh, Neutral is here to here. So it's, you know, either neutral bullish or neutral bearish, kind of your call. Uh, and then you have the bull quiet, which is the green. And you'll see overwhelmingly a lot of green. And then you got the blue. And the blue is bull volatile. So you've got neutral, bull quiet, bull volatile. Each one of those tells us something. Each one of those we can measure against. It gives us a lot of information. And it, it just tells us, okay, you're meeting in Miami in June. You don't need every tool out there. You don't need to look at the market fresh every day thinking, oh, what is going to happen today? What should I be doing today? Well, I could be buying the dip. I could be selling the rip. Uh, I could be, uh, you know, a, a delta neutral. I could, be, um, I could be shorting VIX. I could be uh, long. Uh, December natural gas short March 2023 mar natural like it you could you could look at the market every if you don't have context to what's gonna happen what's likely to happen in that area then you're just gonna come at the market every single day like oh, I'm gonna do this and hope that works and uh, instead what we do is we break it up into chunks and when we know that we're in bear quiet now all I need to do is like okay what happens I just need to go find every other instance that has this area on this chart and see what, and I'm using daily charts for this. Don't, it works best on a daily chart. Doesn't work good on intraday timeframes. So five minutes, this doesn't help you. Uh, weeklies and monthlies doesn't help you as much. Um, it's really best on a one day chart. Okay. So what I want to do is go find all the examples of this and C, get some characteristics of what happened during bear quiet. Now, since I've been doing this for so long, I have a huge amount of data. Um, I've collected a amount of data and the systems mastery course that I run is, uh, it looks like this is what AK is talking about there. Um, there you go. Uh, he, he, what he typed in the uh, thing is, is, is quite good. Um, by by when we move into a bear quiet market regime, we flip everything and we go straight to day trading. Day trading is like just murders this market right now. Get in some equity futures and day trade them. Uh, in the past, I think in the past two or three weeks, I'm up uh, 25, 30 R maybe by now, um, which is... Um, it's not a not points. It's uh, a measurement of risk. So R is if I risk a hundred dollars per trade, then I've made let's say it's call it thirty R. I've made three thousand dollars. If it's you know a thousand dollars per trade that I'm risking, so if I got stopped out, I would lose a thousand dollars. If that's the case, I, you know I'm at thirty thousand dollars right now. So it's a measurement of risk in the percent based on the size of your account. We talked about, I've been talking a lot about uh, the importance of being properly funded. 
having enough capital to uh, trade these markets, you know, you, you got a $3,000 account, you, you have to be extremely special to turn that into $6,000. And then, because that means you're risking pretty much everything. Uh, and so if you were to get stopped out, you would have lost everything. So it was pure luck. No, no system is going to be 100% accurate, especially no human is going to be 100% accurate on all their trades. Um, and, and so understanding that the, the, a losing trade is not a reflection of you. It's just a reflection of the market doing something different. Even if you have a, a, a highly back-tested, thoroughly, you know, uh, rigorously developed trading system, it's not, you know, every losing trade is not that you're, you're a loser. It's just part of the trades. Like I've got, you know, my trading systems, I've got thousands of trade of data of trades and, you know, 55 to 70 ish percent win rate. So if, if my ego was tied up in the fact that I was, um, uh, whether a trade was a winner or a loser, I would feel pretty bad about myself, you know, maybe almost half the time. But if I'm following my system correctly, you know, employing proper risk management, that's my metric. If I do a poor job of following my risk management, then yeah, I'm actually an idiot. But if I follow my risk management and I follow my trading system to a T, then I know the outcome should be what it was on my back test. If I'm messing it up, then if I'm messing it up, then I'll probably lose. So, um, okay. So right now we're in the bear quiet market regime. And I'm going to give you some other, if you look on the chart here, see how few times in the last 10 years it's been down there. It's pretty rare. This was the 2018 bottom. Uh, this would have been the global financial crisis. You can see it. It, it was down there, but it, it, like relatively speaking, let me see if I can make it a little bit bigger. Relatively speaking, it, you know, um, it, it wasn't as big as everybody makes it out to be. Yeah, you went from what, 1600 down to 600. So, you know, 60 something percent. Yeah, that happened. I, I concur. <laughs> I was there. <laughs> But, um, but you'll notice how few times we actually get into bear markets. So the bear market is the red here. So it's, it's very infrequent. And in fact, let me give you some statistical data that I have on that. For the S&P 500, for the last uh, 70 years of trading, it's gone into a bear market 13% of the time. Now, if, if we just organize it by bearish and bullish regimes, 86% of the time for the S&P 500 has been in bull markets and only almost 14% of the time was in a bear market. So right away, we know where you know, a big edge lies. It's being on the long side of the S&P 500. And you can see if we're in there right now, you would expect us to be closer to bottoming than turning into something worse. Now, they can last. I mean, this one lasted, if you kind of count it from November to 07 to April 09, you know, that was a year and a half. That was probably the biggest bear market we had prior to the 2000, uh, the 2000 to 2003. Uh, or two, um, recession, double recession. Um, so the, the recession from 2000 to 2002, 2003 was bigger than the global financial crisis, uh, you know, in length, because we went from 15 down to seven. So almost the same distance on global financial crisis. This one just happened faster. But then we look and it hasn't really done anything since then. So, um, one important piece of data is, is to know about that is this one is if, you know, it's, it's not the best idea statistically to be focused on the bear market. Um, let me take the head and shoulder stuff off. I'm just, the reason I have that there is because people are going to look at it and people are going to start talking about it and reacting to it. So don't, 
it, it's not a good signal. It's not a good way to keep you in the market or to trade from uh, unless you've done the work on it to know how to trade it. Uh, Peter Brandt has done a lot of work on those. So he's got some good data on it. But it's not part of my trading system. I just know a lot of people follow Peter and I know a lot of people uh, are going to see it without even trying and uh, trying to understand what it is and they're going to they're going to get hurt. And so, uh, okay, so let's, we've got bull volatile, which is the blue, bull quiet, which is green, neutral, which is uh, yellow. Uh, uh, you're correct. <laughs> Sorry, I just saw yours. Uh, bear quiet, which is red, and bear volatile, which is crimson. And the amount of times that you, I mean, you can see just where, how often we're in the green, right? You can also see where tops happen. Um, tops typically happen. So major reversals happen when we get into bull volatile. And what happens in bull volatile? Let's take a look. Um, you can see it just, it, it's day by day by day is green. Just green after green after green after green after green. Green after green or, or up, up, up. So I, didn't, I don't mean green, I'm sorry. Up day, 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 up day. Update, 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 update. You know, update, update, update. So um, typically, when you get in, when you get those blues, uh, they don't indicate that you're going to top. You can certainly stay in that for a while, but eventually it tops, and that's what we use to uh, to get out right here. We got out literally the last day of August 2020 after writing this COVID rally all summer long, we got out right in here. It wasn't because it turned blue, because if we got out when it turned blue, we would have got out 3340 and missed the, you know, another 120 points on it. Which is, it just means that the conditions are a certain way, right? So think about that. That's the importance of the market regime. The market regime is to tell you what is more than likely or more likely to be happening. It doesn't mean that it's the end of things. So getting caught in the idea of picking the bottom or picking the top is less useful than being in uh, knowing what to expect in that environment and preparing for it. So when you get to uh, red here, bull, uh, bear quiet, think to yourself, okay, this is where we want to start looking for the market. First of all, we want to go to day trading strategies. So if we were shorting, if we were swing short or anything like that, we don't want to be holding those too much longer. We want to be very light on our feet. Another factor here is in this market regime, the rallies are vicious. They are big. I mean, we're already up 2% today. Uh, you know, the sell-offs are fast. And the rallies are big. So this sell-off was five, almost 5% in one day. Uh, and then we've pretty much put in another uh, 38 to uh, four, uh, two. So uh, what, 7% move probably since then. So that, that's a better, stronger move. But this was a faster down move. So your down moves are faster. Your up moves get a little bit better. And But again, day trading is what works in this regime. Another point here is it isn't the opposite. Bull volatile is a market top. Doesn't mean if ever in bear volatile, it's a market bottom. That doesn't mean it. It uh, typically bear volatile is the worst sell days of, you know, of, of history. <laughs> uh, and they typically are met with government intervention. So you typically have the Fed or somebody stepping in, the government stepping in really, really hard in bear volatile. So you can have like a 9% up day in a bear volatile. And, uh, you know, that's the reason you see so few is because, yeah, it's, uh, you know, the government isn't going to let those happen. And as I pointed out in my statistics, uh, bear volatile days account for less than 1% of all trading days on the S&P 500 in the last 70 years. So less than 1%. So trying to, trying to catch the bear market bottom is, uh, I mean, you're waiting for a very long time for those to happen. Uh, but when they happen, they're usually, you can't size your positions correctly. So you end up 
getting uh, stopped out, even though it looks like the most obvious thing in the world the following week. So instead of trying to go long, when you get that fair volatile crimson reading, what you want to do is just say, okay, conditions are in place for reversal. Let me see where that is. And if we were to do that, we have to go back to 2018 to get that. If we did that, so, okay, this would have been the day, these two days that we got the, the bear volatile, right? Well, you know, had we bought somewhere in here, this is a five and a half percent day, you know, you could easily have gotten stopped out five times trying to get long here. But where's the easy money? The easy money is, okay, where is right here is when everybody got bared up. So you just, so the way I traded it, I just simply put, okay, this was the range. We, we went up, we went down. And if we break above that range, I'm going to be long. Okay. Now, a lot of people are saying, yeah, but I would have got long at 2320 or something like that. You're getting long at 2530. That's 200 points, knucklehead. Yeah, I'm a knucklehead. That's true. You guys know me. But also, I got in at the safest spot with very good risk reward. And now you can just, you catch these the whole way through. And so, yeah, instead of not getting stopped out and frustrated and, and destroyed in this area, I wait to where it's really easy, where it's confirming that it's coming up or not, not confirming, but very much supporting that it's going to be rising. And then, okay, where did it go from there? It went from uh, 2,500 to 2,800 to 3,000, uh, you know, back down to 2,700 and, and, you know, kept doing that. And then finally into the summertime, we had some, some craziness. Uh, and so, you know, you get stopped out, but yeah, you're not catching, you know, you're leaving hundred or 200 points on the, on the tape, on the, yeah, on the table, but that's fine because you can size your positions. You, you have to do like a mini or a micro one mini, you know, probably like a couple of micro contracts to catch a bottom. But if you wait for the risk reward to be in your favor, you can probably get in with a couple of mini contracts. So 10 times larger of a position with far less risk. So even though you missed out on, let's say, 200 points in move, by waiting, you now were able to put on, um, we were able to put on a, uh, a much bigger position and take advantage of the next 300 points with 10 times the amount of size and low risk. Um, so that's what we got over there. That's bear vault. Bear quiet. What works in bull quiet, you just kind of buy any weakness. So for the last couple of years, just buying any weakness in this market regime worked really well, right? You pretty much uh, from, let's say, 3,000 to 40, 4,800, that worked really, really well on the S&P 500, right? But it didn't, uh, but that's not what works in bear quiet. Bull quiet works fantastically. Bear quiet does not work that well because look, you're, you're getting these 5% down move, 7% up moves, all these huge moves bear in bull quiet. Eh, it's just kind of, you know, half a percent, 1%, mostly in the up direction. These are just two ways so quickly. So that's why we go with day trading in the bear quiet. Once we get into neutral, then we start looking for it to travel back into bear quiet where we're going to start buying weakness. So you can kind of sit on your hands, stick with day trading in the neutral, uh, and then it'll, as it rallies into bull volatile, you start looking at opportunities to exit or hedge uh, or, you know, make a bigger, once the bull volatile top comes in, start to find a, a reversal here. So um, that's what we got with market regimes. That's why it's so important. And when we know what we've got, how to deal with market regimes, then we know we can scan the market. So one trade we're currently in right now, first of all, let's take a look at Russell. I'm long Russell uh, from the uh, from the open, um, not there, it was higher, uh, but I'm in a couple of contracts of the Russell, uh, mostly right in this area here, 18, yeah. Um, and you know we're up 15 points or something like that. Uh, okay, I got a number of questions here. So give me a second. I'm going to read these and we'll throw some context here. So Jurg, I recall you saying for NASDAQ that there can never be a market top without it going into bull volatile and to have then an exponential move. Was that still the case end of 2021? It was. It was very quick. It's right here. So it's how you measure it. It's very subjective. 
but you can see the way I measure that is above there, right in here. And it went into bull volatile. And another thing I measure, well, it's not on this, is the uh, pivots. And we did the, I think it was November. So we met all three requirements for a major market top. And it took uh, from November to January, it took two months before it really started to, to ease off. Unlike the, the September August, September of 2020, which it happened rather quickly. So not everyone is the same there. It's just, that's why it's important to know that you have the opportunity ahead of you. doesn't mean it's going to happen. Just, you just got to be prepared for those sort of things to happen. Okay. Um, how did market behave after other Crimson Day in 2001? Uh, I don't know. Let's look. And right, let's go to uh, ES. Scrolling. So 2001, 2001 bottom here. Yeah, it bottom. You can see it right there. Pretty, pretty, uh, pretty right on um, right there. But it's not because there's so few instances of it. It's not, um, and it's just tradable. It doesn't mean that the whole market is going to reverse forever. It's just tradable. So you see, we got a bottom and it goes from, was that nine to about 12? So 200 points and then turned over again. And then we got another one. We, get, we go from seven to nine and turned over again. Um, and, and okay, we'll take a look at 2008, sure. Um, so did we get one? I don't know if we got one in 2008. Oh, we did. Okay. Uh, so we got the bottom there and it took a while for it to, uh, for it to play out, but eventually it did. So um, it's not the be all end all. Again, it is not an indicator to tell you exactly what to do when it happens. It's just telling you the environment is ripe for those sort of things. Uh, so right now we don't have, we don't have to get crimson to bottom here is another point. Antonio, I'll see you. I'll get you in a second. Um, you know, on, on, we don't need it for it to hit crimson right here for, uh, for us to get a, a market bottom. It does, that, that isn't a requirement for a major market bottom, uh, you know, especially in equities because equities are built by design to go up. Uh, you don't have as many, and you have so few instances of them. But when you get them, then all it's telling you, it's telling you this is an environment where you need to start paying attention. If I was to say, hey, it's, uh, it's April, and um, I will talk about Prop Yang. Uh, it's April, and I live in the Northern Hemisphere, and uh, it snowed last week. Would that tell you, oh, well, we're not going to get snow ever again because April indicates we're done with snow. And then you get snow again, and you're like, what the hell? I guess we didn't get it. I guess we're not finishing winter or spring. You know, we're not going into summer this year. It's just going to keep doing it. No, you're pretty well aware that, that the snow is going to stop. Maybe not in April. It may go into like last week in Colorado, where they got six inches of snow. It may show up, but more than likely right now, if I'm thinking of a trip to Colorado, I'm thinking, yeah, I'm probably going to bring a jacket and, you know, maybe a couple of layers just in case. But it's pretty close to summertime right now. So they did get that snow, but I'm pretty certain that it's probably done snowing for now. So I'm just going to um, pack a little bit lighter and expect maybe some rain if we get it and, you know, some cold nights. But I'm expecting things to start looking a little bit better and everybody's going to be kind of happy that it's not snowing anymore. Right. So you just want the environment to be set up. It's not a, if this happens, then do that. That's not the case. It says, okay, what tools do I need to employ during this time to have the best success? And that, that's what you get. So if you were to take the S&P and go back all the way into the 1950s, you would see examples of uh, probably why it's not wise to do much work in a bear quiet, and you can make all your money in uh, neutral and uh, bull quiet and bull volatile. Okay, Antonio. 
Um, got confused here. Using SQN on TradingView for the S&P 500, I see it on bearer volatile regime. Using 100 days, daily time frame, SQN, Chris D. Fallible indicator. Um, okay. What ticker are you using, Antonio? Are you still here, by the way? Because it might have taken me a minute to <laughs> ES1. Um, ES1 on, yeah, I don't have it yet. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe let's do a quick search to see what. I think, I don't know. There's a new V2. I have a V2 in there right now, I think. Or the S, uh, I don't know which one is communities. Oh, uh, here it is, community scripts. I updated it. Yeah, I updated it recently. So you may have to just, uh, you're using SPX? Okay, let's, that does make a difference. Okay, no. Um, yeah, it, it's still the same, SPX one day. You might need to delete it and add it again, uh, Antonio, because I, I had to, I did go in and um, update it because there were some things that uh, it, if it's in a different one, it might actually, there, the older version uh, should look like this. Uh, Yang, let's talk about prop funding. You got it, dude. Uh, MF. Uh, when you have time, could you tell what you think about FTMO? I'll just pass their challenge, and I heard many people get paid. But I want to know if uh, if you think on a long-term perspective, it's something that will keep you staying. Uh, yeah, I do think so, MF. Uh, FTMO is probably one of the best-known prop firms, uh, international prop firms. Um, so you don't have as much. There, there's some downside. I believe they are, are they, they're in the EU, I believe. So I don't, under, I don't know the the risks of, you know, what I, I, they check, I think, um, if I recall. I don't know if there's any like legal reciprocity that you might have by, uh, through them, through the European Union. I don't know. Um, I can speak for the firms in the United States, uh, being married to an attorney. My wife always advised me like, well, we would go with this one because the, the rule of law in the United States would favor a US citizen. Um, and so if there was, uh, anything out there that, um, you know, any issues have, you could have the right to, you know, the ability to, uh, sue them and, and, and for recourse. Um, okay. But I, I think they're great. They've been, you know, they came out in, I think it was 2019. Um, they came out swinging and, uh, they took the top step model of a, of a challenge tryout to do it. Um, and they, uh, um, I've heard nothing, you know, they're, they're aggressive, you know, they're, they're, they they have some strict requirements, by the way, congratulations for passing the, uh, um, good deal. Good to know guys. Um, BJ, uh, I've heard nothing but great things about FTMO. If you can pass the challenge, it's great. Um, one of the biggest thing I've heard about those is uh, just like all challenges is people have problems because the challenges are so challenging, but uh, it's because you're trading professional. You're not trading. You're not. You're not. You're not a piker in your your own account. You know. You're trading somebody else's money professionally, and so they're going to put risk management on you to make sure that they don't uh, get injured. But they're also going to give you the opportunity to make a boatload of money um, over time. I would highly recommend keeping the mindset in your prop account of you know. What can I work up to in a year? Not, you know, can I make 10,000 this month right away? But what can I work up to this year? Have that mindset when you work in prop and you start building these things up over time and you, you really figure it out. A lot of people take prop challenges and do all this stuff thinking that it is, um, uh, you know, a prop firm wants you to make $10,000 a day every day. They don't. They want you to make a steady income every day with very low risk. That's the big incentive for a prop firm. And I'm putting together a prop course right now on trading systems, how to pass uh, the prop challenges, which is the minor problem there. Uh, the big problem 
is staying funded as a prop trader once you've passed the challenge. That's the real problem. The rules don't change. They don't get any easier. They stay the same. They just keep up in your uh, buying power. So that's really the only difference of being funded and non-funded um, as far as rules go. Uh, Yang would be good to know uh, the pros and cons of different prop shops, CTI, Top Step, Lux, et cetera. What kind of trading style suits which firm better? Uh, for me, I've discovered that CTI and Lux are great for swing trading, um, but you can definitely day trade. Uh, but a place like Top Step or Apex, you cannot swing trade. So you're only day trading at those firms. Um, CTI and Lux are, uh, I've, I've passed the, the tryout with both. Um, we have a couple of traders in here in the lab who've passed the tryouts and, and work with both. Um, you know, the, speaking of those, um, just like all of this, you know, you, you want to find the, um, you want to find the ideal strategy for the market you're in right now. So with Lux, for example, this is Lux's watch list. This is Global Prime. This is all the tickers you can trade. That's like 100 or so uh, stocks, Apple, Airbnb, all that. You can trade volatility futures. Uh, you can trade bonds. You can trade the commodity, the, the ags. You can trade global indices from Hong Kong, uh, Spain, Italy, Germany, UK, Japan, uh, the Dow, the S&P, the, the NASDAQ. You can trade uh, Natty, which we're in right now. Uh, I got a big, long position on nat natural gas that's been fantastic. And I'm, I've locked in 2R on that. I'll show you that one in a second. Uh, you can trade Brent and you can trade uh, West Texas. You got gold and silver, palladium, platinum, copper, and then you can trade gold and silver versus the euro and gold versus the Aussie. And then you got the FX, all the FX exotics and the main 28 pairs. So huge amount of things you can trade with uh, Lux. So you can, if, if you just want to specialize on one type of trading, which is probably what you do, you find a handful of different assets that are completely different than each other and just go around to each one of those. Um, let's see, realistically, do we usually manage only one prop account, one firm at a time, or you can do top step plus CTA? The way I do it is I use Apex funding because uh, they have bigger accounts. Um, and uh, Apex doesn't charge you to, uh, to get multiple data feeds. It's 85 bucks a month for all data feeds. There's 35 futures contracts that you can trade with Apex. Uh, you would have, to, you know, you're paying for all the data feeds that you choose to trade with, uh, with top step. Um, and then the other, so I, I day trade on apex and I, uh, which is similar to top step, just different. Um, and I swing trade on, uh, Lux right now. And so that, that's pretty much how I trade. Uh, so my end of day trading is literally me doing this. Just boom, is there a trade? Nope. Is there a trade? Nope, possibly. Uh, anyway, um, Yang, uh, if I'm wrong, I thought, but I thought CTI has one of the highest account AUM limits. Yeah, you can, you can run two $2 million accounts with uh, CTI. The thing about it is um, everything, will, <laughs> the thing I've noticed about those firms in the last year or two, last two years, is that they change the rules midway through. Um, and so, you know, you, you jump on board with something like I jump on board with something like, uh, Lux knowing that I had $2 million account ahead of me at a 80% payout. And then they change that down to a 50% payout. So I'm like, oh, but I've already put in, you know, a year with Lux. So, you know, yeah, I could go and do another one with, uh, them, but at the same time, after, you know, a year or two, you're going to have, you're going to be at the peak level and you're going to have negotiating skills. So you can go to a, uh, another prop firm and just say, "Hey, here's my here's my record from Lux. Can you know? Can we work out a funding scenario? Uh, I'm going to trade the same way. I just don't want to start out at fifteen thousand dollars again. I want to come in at you know five hundred and you know or fifty thousand. You work me up to a million or two million. Um, 
And that once you have that track record, you can do that. Uh, MF, uh, do you think those prop firms online have a real capital behind it? Or is it true that the capital comes from losers? As many people claim, I'm asking always for the same reason of long-term longevity. Thank you. MF, um, I know that a lot, the way a lot of the prop firms are created, uh, some of them are, are trying to self-fund through the tryouts. Uh, but you can definitely see that both Lux and City had made a bunch of changes uh, once they realized that that wasn't the case and they, they went out and they raised capital. Um, I think FTMO did the same thing. Um, and then there was this group called Funding Talent last year who uh, pretty much they blew up and they, they screwed a bunch of people over. And that's what everybody's really worried about is putting in you know three months or six months with a company like Funding Talent who becomes insolvent because they suddenly have a bunch of traders who they're you know who are really good and funding talent i i assume i don't know but that firm basically um they basically put up all these rules that were challenging and so they got a bunch of traders not challenging they're a little more lenient and so a bunch of traders passed the challenge they didn't think they would be passing the challenge and they didn't think that the the, the traders would make so much money i mean i made I had a $38,000 that they never paid me, um, but it's no big deal. I mean, it's really no big, just move on, you know, like wasn't that big a deal for me. Um, you know, yeah, it would have been nice to make that $38,000, but they, they're out of business. So, you know, whatever, uh, we didn't know what we know now. Right. Um, Yang asks, uh, if I'm wrong, okay, we already talked about that, Yang. What prop firm has the most relaxed rules around volatility for swing trading individual equity? Uh, individual equity strategy, so trading equities. Um, uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't trade equities, really. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I don't I don't actually trade equities. And and for the most part, I wouldn't want to have the most relaxed trading rules um personally. Because the um yeah, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't trade uh I don't trade any equities really, uh, except during bull volatile when I'm trading my own option account. Yeah, well, you know, I I get it, MF. Um I get it. Uh, you know, you're going to be, uh, um, you know, being young, <laughs> you get to, you get to have a lot of experiences. You get to, you get to make a lot of mistakes. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, but, but NM, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't, I know SMB trades equities, uh, but they're, uh, they're not easy. Like you, it's a, it's a full intern program. Uh, I highly recommend SMB capital. They're great. If you can get in, uh, they're really good. They'll teach you how to do it and you know, they'll scale you up quite a bit. Uh, I trade with Kirchner a long time ago. They're, they're pretty good. Um, but yeah, I don't trade equities really. So um, I don't know. Sorry. Yang, that sucks. Sorry to hear that. So you, we just have to deal with the constantly changing payout rules from those prop firms and hop between. Uh, well, you know, places like Top Step, haven't really changed apex i um i don't know as much about apex but i've i've been with top step for quite some time uh maverick if if i could recommend if you're okay here's actually if you really want to do the real deal um maverick fx and uh they have a they have an options program too uh i've been with them the longest i've been still with them for seven years um, they're, they're, they're great. They're out of Utah. I actually played high school football against the, uh, the one of uh, the founder, um, Travis, he went to Alta, <laughs> um, Travis high school buddy of mine, by the way, in the group. Um, let's see, uh, they're, they're really good. They're on union union Boulevard in, uh, in Murray, uh, <laughs> right across from the whole foods. Um, I, I think Maverick FX is, is just awesome. Uh, I personally use, uh, well, let's see top step. I've been paid or traded through, 
Uh, I've worked through um, uh, Apex right now and City are who I'm with. And, and I think Lux is, I just haven't really done anything with Lux. Um, mostly I just want to focus. I just want to be focused on uh, one or two. And for me, you know, that's uh, the first focus is uh, right now, especially day trading. So I want to have enough capital that I can take advantage of day trading and, you know, make enough money. Um, one, one thing you want to look at is just how strict their risk management rules are. And I think it's a plus. I think that's a plus. The, the wider the risk management, that was the reason that funding talent, uh, I think blew up is because they had fairly, uh, relaxed, uh, risk management. They didn't do, I don't think they really thought through that. So I think that's why they blew up. I don't know. I mean, I don't know them. I don't, I don't have any you know, hard feelings against them. It, you know, they were experimenting um, and they, uh, they, you know, they didn't figure it out. <laughs> uh, so they've got new information now. Um, hopefully, you know, they'll, um, they'll learn from that experience and, and, you know, they'll be better for it, whether they are, uh, whether they come back and do something else or, you know, who knows, but um, yeah, it, it, tough for them for sure. So, uh, um, so one thing I got going right here is I'm in the, uh, the, this natural gas trade. I got in over, uh, at this level, 779 and we're currently at 9.5. So we're, uh, we're pretty good in on the money on this one right now. Uh, trail stop in right around here. Uh, we caught a lot of this move in natural gas. These are daily charts, by the way. One thing I want to point out here on um, on different things, what I was talking about the S and P five hundred and the market regimes and all that. Understand the equity indices like the S and P, the Nasdaq, the Russell, the Dow. They're built to go up by design. So when because basically the best companies in the market are the companies that are in the S and P five hundred. If you're not a good company. They remove you from the market. Uh, and so it's just, uh, if you're printing money, you sh your stock price should be going up. Um, so that's kind of a thing that you want to see um, in indices. Natural gas doesn't work that way. So Natty, you can be, Natty can spend almost 2% of its life in bear volatile. So about 20% of its life in the bear market regimes and 80% in bull. So natural gas has a different, uh, different way, to, is, is a different animal than just the uh, S&P. So because we have the bull volatile here, uh, doesn't mean we're going to get another major market top in natural gas. You can run bull volatile for, let me pull up the futures here. So you can be in bull volatile for a very long time. You can get a lot more bear volatiles, and that doesn't mean that that's the bottom. So the market regime, you need to understand it individually. You need to do the work. The things like the systems mastery course that I have um, is where you learn how to do that work. I'm not going to give you the work, uh, you know, because you won't, you won't do it. <laughs> you, won't, you won't know how to use it. But if you do the systems mastery course and you do the work, you can understand how all this ties in. So let me get into... Uh, day trading. Feel free to keep asking questions, guys. I'll try to stay up with it. Now, one thing that's been very, very useful for me to day trade is I use the VALD. Okay. So this is the difference between the up volume and the down volume of the New York Stock Exchange. So every stock on the NYSE Basically, what diff what's the difference? If it's positive, this thing is going to go higher, okay? And if it, basically, if there's more selling going on, it's going to go lower. If there's more buying going on, it's going to go up. And, you know, you can see it in the chart over here as well. You can see that we're going up and, yep, we're going up. But on a day like yesterday, it was up, but it didn't, it wasn't until the end that it really kicked in. But we had a clue. 
we had a clue going into the FOMC minutes that it was going to go probably it was more bullish yesterday than it was bearish. So we knew that. Same thing on this thing called the cumulative tick. So this is a just go into uh, um, uh, I think yeah, it's cumulative tick by Vesterito copy um, right here. Just this is the just type in cumulative tick in the search on trading view and it'll be cumulative tick by investorito copy uh or cumulative tick investorito i made a copy of it so that i could edit it as needed so that's what this is so it um it's reading the tick i have it set up so it's weird yeah um, it's, it's actually reading the tick and it's making its histogram based on an average, the cumulative average of the last, uh, X number nine ticks. So five minute bars. So last 45 minutes. And this is, this is the open. And you can see all day long, the cumulative tick has been rising yesterday, the cumulative tick open and kind of went sideways, but it was bullish. So yesterday's trading, we knew that. It can also go negative. It certainly can. It doesn't mean that it's going to be positive. But what this tells me is we have a strong up day. It's an easy trend, easy trend, and we're just we're rising. You know, this was yesterday's trading. This was yesterday's trading. So from the open rally pullback and ripped higher, you can see rally kind of pull back and then ripped higher. So during the bull or bear quiet market regime, why day trading works so good? Because there's a lot of multi-direction and a lot of people don't believe in the trend or they look to uh, fade trends or they look to, uh, you know, everybody's all bared up right now. So you're going to see a lot, of, um, a lot of moves higher. And so I look at things like that for breadth. That's telling me what the market's doing under the under the hood. What's going on in the markets? You know, is it why is it going up? Uh, well, I don't really care why it's going up. Is it going up or is it going down? And so you can see it's going up over here. Let me uh, drag it over, and you can see like there were some pretty down days over there. You know, the last few months, um, a lot of down days in April. You can just see how much that was in there, right? Met by a couple of strong days, but you can also look at like the big, just big, big down days over here. A couple of big up days for sure. Um, but relatively speaking, it was, you know, they're very kind of few. Um, mostly it was on the downside. Uh, and we can, you know, we can drag this out quite a bit. But yeah, all the way into March, you can see some big down days. And we, we got our biggest down days here uh, in March. And from this last one, uh, what day was this one been? 20, yeah, Friday right here. This was Friday and you can see it turned inside it at the end. Started off to go down and then it came roaring back. So this is a tool I really love to use in day trading. Um, you don't have to use, you know, breath, but if you're curious what's going on, it's quite helpful. And then finally, you know, one thing I use, I use a couple of different setups. I either use the scalpy setup, which basically fades, uh, looks to establish a trend and then fades the, the uh, reverse, reversion to the trend. But this one, I use a pivot system. And what it measures, is, it's just a simple pivot strategy. Um, this is basically the pivots are generated from the overnight. So this was, this is night trading on the Russell right here. This was the high and this was the low. So this is the middle. These crosses here are the middle. This is the high of the overnight and this is the low of the overnight. You see, we took out the high, came back and tested it. And then on the open, just blasted off. So what this does is this gives me an idea of where we are in relationship to the yesterday's range, the overnight range, 
and tells me who's going to have control of the ball on the, on the trading day. So when you're above this area right here, the first one, um, no, you don't use SQN intraday. Never use SQN intraday, only on the one at one day. Um, so the, uh, so the first we got over the overnight high, this means bulls are in control. And then we close, if we close above this midline here, then this says, uh, we signaling a bullish breakout. And then if we hold five minutes above this line, we confirm the bullish breakout, which has happened. And then if we go above this one, we have uh, a, a trend extension. So 1846 is likely where we're going to get some resistance here, but so about three more points on it. So you're, we only use SQN on the daily to give us an idea of what tools we want to mess around with intraday or what trading style we're gonna use. It only tells us what we're gonna do. Like, I, you know, Miami, being in Miami doesn't tell me what I'm going to do just because I'm in Miami uh, in, in summertime. Like I still have to choose the things to do, right? And it's going to happen for a lot of the time in Miami because it's gonna be hot and humid and sunny that's what the SQN tells me. The SQN tells me, okay, you need a day trading strategy. So having, um, I don't know anything about Toby. Uh, you can go on and I'll give you my, let me know hit, hit what they are, MF, and you know, I'll give you my perspective of it. Um, but what we got is um, we know that in the bear quiet market regime, day trading is the strategy we want to employ. We're not looking to uh, we're not looking to buy dips or, uh, you know, hold long, long-term positions. We're just looking for, okay, what is it going to be? What direction are we in and how do we get into the ideal position? So for me today, I can say, well, we're trending up, we're trending up and we're trending up. Uh, once we got above the opening range, I can start saying, okay, I want to be long. Now we also know We also know that this trend line that I was talking about on S&P is even stronger on the Russell right today. This, this is a big move on the Russell, whereas, you know, it, it wasn't as strong. Uh, yesterday, we got up to that one on the Russell. We closed above it and the S&P did not. Um, and so what I know right now is Russell is leading, it seems, the indices up. It led the indices down. We can see it went into a bear market back in June or January. Um, you know, about right in right in here. Whereas the S and P went into a bear market in April, April twenty second. This one went into January. So the it that it's leading out of it might make you know make more sense. It's a little uh, thing. I don't know. Let's have a look at what will be. Well. For Forex, I, again, I don't know what his, uh, his things are on Forex, um, but because Forex trades 24-7 or 24-5, uh, yeah, they're pivots. Um, the, uh, since Russell trades and it trades the Asia, the Europe, and the US session, it has three sessions that it trades. Um, I don't know that the opening range stuff works as good on those. Um, what I find that I love to trade on those is, uh, I like to trade the, um, I trade the Bollinger Bands on multiple time frames. I'll show you here. Here's the other strategy. So, uh, I've got a, basically a one hour, a 30 minute and a 15 minute. You can use a two and a five and a 10 minute. You can use a five, a 10 and a 15 minute. Use a one hour, a four hour, a 12 hour. Basically, what you want is you want a longer time frame, mid time frame, and a shorter time frame to give you um, confluence. So, this strategy is part, again, I was talking about doing the, uh, I'm, I've kind of been hinting at the, uh, the prop trading course, which I'm going to be releasing later in May. Uh, was you're getting some hints of it right now, this strategy will be in there. So let's uh, let's throw um, what's a fun one uh, USD JPY. So here's a great setup on it. We had 
uh, this morning. And so what you want is you want a touch of the bottom Bollinger, which we got on all three time frames. Okay. On the, this is the five, 15 minute, this is the 30 minute, and this is the 60 minute. So they're all lined up at the bottom Bollinger. What do we know about Bollinger bands? Bollinger band, and these are standard Bollinger bands. Bollinger bands are, uh, Bollinger bands are two standard deviations of the previous 20 bars, the average of the previous 20 bars, two standard deviations up and two down. And typically those tend to signal where a market's going to be returning, uh, reverting from. So if it's a strong trend, it doesn't really, you know, it, it, it just keeps going uh, in one direction oftentimes. So trend days are different, but also you can find times where it, it just bangs back and forth. Now this is a low, this is about a 55, 60% win rate strategy, but you make two to one. So you make two R on winners and you lose one R on losers. And you can get, if you trade in the shorter time frame, later Yang, um, appreciate you. Uh, in the shorter time frame, uh, you can get two to four trades within about a two to three hour period. So with a 50, let's call it 50% win rate, four trades. So two winners are four R, two winners are two R. You walk away with a two R trading day, two R trading, 20 trading days. That's 40 R in a month. If you guys understand the, the, the R method. Um, it's not about your win rate. It's about implementing the strategy correctly and taking your losses when they're losses and knowing that you've got Another 20, 30 minutes from now, you're probably going to have another trade. Another 20, 30 minutes from now, you're going to have another trade. So what we had here, we had a touch of the Bollinger, touch of the Bollinger, touch of the Bollinger. So basically what I'm looking for is, uh, okay, we've touched, come down, a pullback. And so the way I'm going to trade it is I'm going to buy above this bar here. I'm going to put my stop below the swing low. Okay, because all the one hour, the 30 and the 15 are all lined up. And I'm going to look to uh, um, I'm going to look to take profits at two R, which it looks like we got. Oops, right down here. And yep, hit two R right here. So uh, within oh, you know, a couple hours. Um, you hit 2R on this. Now, this was at 2 a.m. I'm, if I'm day trading these, I'm trading them off of a shorter time frame. But it works on all time frames. And then we get up to here. Um, are we at a line? Oh. Uh, so currently, you can see it. Um, now, USDJPY is up here. AK looks like you got a bear set up on the dollar yen. <laughs> it's a super secret code right there uh, that he made. So um, could work. But uh, at the moment, there's no, there's no solid setup because it didn't touch the Bollinger, didn't touch the Bollinger, and hasn't touched the Bollinger here. So what's nice about it is it keeps you out of the market when there's nothing to be doing, and it can keep you in. Now, uh, you can trail stop these sometimes, especially if, you have, if you're in a good trend. But since this is a downward trend, uh, you're only going to take the 2R. If, it, if you get a setup up here, then you can take the trend down because you're currently in the downtrend. Let me see what was happened. Um, colored lines you showed on Russell, were they pivots? They were pivots. Um, I'll, I mean, I'm going to be including that in the, uh, in the course as well, um, the, the code for it and everything. So I don't know how to release it otherwise. Um, it's a... So let me see what MF says, because I think a lot of what MF is saying is what the strategy is based off of. For example, if an opening range has a small range, you buy a breakout since very often the low of the opening range is the low for the day. He made some very good statistics about it, but since Forex, it's 24 hours a day, not sure if it still works for that good in FX. Also curious, what do you think about looking at multiple timeframes? I definitely find multiple timeframes to be extremely useful. It is a big, major, major edge. Big time, MF. Absolutely. It is. Oh, and we hit tag that 1846. All right. That's the, now it has to go all the way up to 1876 to continue to reset. I'm sorry, 1861 uh, to continue to reset. Let me put my labels on. Oh, 
so we did it. So it was here. Oh, so we're going to uh, MR5. So now in order to, we've already extended the trend M three and a half. Now we could potentially go to MR5. So we're in a trend extension day. This could be a really monster day. Um, okay. Uh, so that, that makes it challenging MF, but you can look at the way I would do it is I would look at yesterday's high and lows. And the way I, the way I actually tend to do it is, I'll show you on Russell here. Um, the overnight high was here. So I'm watching the, not, not the opening range. Cause I don't, I don't trade the opens. I don't trade the open was right here, by the way, I wait at least an hour, maybe two hours until the open's done before I start trading MF. Um, but this was the overnight high. So yesterday's trading closed here, um, right in here. Uh, and then the low the overnight low was right here. So I'll draw the lines. So overnight range was here and here. This was also the overnight range too. So, um, but that's the range. Once it, live trading, when it broke out of there, it broke out and just went. So some days you have that. I look at my UVOL or my VOLD and I look at my cumulative tick. And I also knew about this trend. So the big time frame also ruled that. And so for me, once it closed above the midline or closed above here, it's called MR1. When it closed above that, that, and that, and held the time filter five minutes above 1816, once it held above MR2 for five minutes, I just bought because that was the, uh, that, you know, basically buy out a, a close above a pullback to the overnight breakout by a fade that. So smart trade would have been getting long in here, but I don't trade the open usually leave that for, um, for the rookies. Uh, I let it, I let it tell me what is the low pro, uh, or the high probability, low risk trade of the day. And I take that. And so, yeah, I could have bought down here, but the size would have been much smaller. So now that I'm up in here, I'm certain bulls take control signals, bullish breakout confirms a bullish breakout. So in here, I've confirmed that we have a bullish breakout. So now it's very easy for me to put on my correct position size and get in. And then when we consolidated up in here, uh, I knew, well, we're not, we, I basically said, if it breaks from here, I'm going to get, I'm going to add to that. I'm going to double up again. So instead of trying to catch the low point right there, I wait for it to be low risk and I can put on a lot more size and catch the trade. And I'm up 10 on a double position size right now, 10 points. So uh, my R's. So I'm up two R right now on the day on a double position size. So that's actually a four R trade today. And that's the benefit of, uh, you know, that's the benefit of having one, knowing your statistics, because I've manually back tested this a thousand times. So I know everything I need to know about this. Um, if it, if it doesn't do what it does, then, you know, okay, that's the, that's telling me that, uh, it doesn't, it's not going to do what I had expected it to do and cool. You know what? That's fine. Uh, I'm out. So can you please, uh, thanks a lot. Interesting, Chris. I'll definitely go deeper into studying multiple time frames. Yeah. So I absolutely think, uh, multiple time frames. Very good. Very, very good. Uh, you can you please show us an example of your price action setups and how do you manage your trades? Sure. Um, well, this is basically a price action trade. Um, what I can see is this one was so bullish, and the other context around it is where it was above the overnight high. Big strong move above the overnight high, above there, above all that, after a breakout and testing it. So that tells me it's a strong bullish day. And then this breaking out of this, these ranges, one, two, three, uh, and holding five minutes above it confirmed to me that we were on a strong trend day today. And then I look over here and it's confirmed. And so if it was going to fail, it would have failed right here. So 
a break, a pullback, a break. And this right here would have been ideal short setup. So that's the price action that would have been ideal. And it failed. It put in a hammer right here and then blew it away. And then another hammer here, that was a shooting star. A big full body candle, pull back. And it keeps, it kept consolidating, <clears throat> but it kept drifting. And also I, I, I knew this over here. I knew that this was all my accumulative tick. And I knew that my, my Vol D were all trending up. So it was just pretty obvious that we were going to spend, uh, we were going to continue to go. Um, and so I, so my entry would have been first entry here with a stop right here. Okay. So that tells me how to size my position because if I'm risking, you know, 0.2% or 0.1% per trade on, let's say it's a, so I got a $300,000 account. I'm risking 0.1%. So every loser is $300. So if I'm trading, uh, so I'm up 300, I'm up 600. Then when I come up into here, uh, when it was supposed to sell off, it didn't. So I added another double. So doubled my position up and raised my stop up to here. So I even bigger position size. And now I'm, I'm trailing this guy up. And once that goes up to there, I move my stop to break even plus a tick. So if this one gets stopped out, I make the money on this one and I pay commissions on this one. But if it keeps going, <clears throat> Then I'll just keep raising my stops up. Uh, okay, MF. On day trading, do you prefer to manage your stop loss dynamically or get out at a pre? Uh, I dynamically, uh, depending on uh, depending on if I'm trading, which strategy I'm trading. So if I'm trading the uh, uh, the 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 one I showed you on on the dollar yen with the Bollinger Bands and the three time frames, uh, I take profits at two R on that. Uh, on this one, this is built to trail stop. Mm. Because it goes and it goes, it continues to have different things that it, different environments happen as it continues to go. Um, this is a solid cell uh, reversal happening right here. And so I, you know, looking at the size of this and this uh, at a, another pivot level, if that fails to sell off, it's probably just going to keep going higher. But no, I'm, I'm not looking to just exit at a predetermined level. Um, you can do that. You can do that. Now, one of the reasons I would do it is because I like to have a, um, I like to do other things. You know, I like to, uh, I like to go hiking. I like to work out. Uh, Um, you know, I, I, here shortly, I'm, I'm going to go work out in my, in my garage. Uh, I got a bunch of writing to do. Um, and then, uh, I want to go for a nice afternoon hike because it's getting warm here. And I just, that's why we moved here is for the heat and the sun. So this, you know, after that, I'm going to go, go out for a couple hours. Um, and it, uh, you know, it just keeps, uh, so for me, it's kind of hard to write these days. It's actually been very easy to just put a stop in and let the trade breathe all day. Uh, and then I get home right at the end of the market after my hike and right before the end of the market. And I pretty much just exit end of day. That's how it's been happening all week. And I've, or last two weeks and it's been really good. Um, yeah, to add to your positions. Yeah. Add to them. Uh, the way I like to do it, you know, you're going to have to do the manual back testing. What I'm talking about here is things that I've learned in the markets and hopefully they give you a direction to start learning, uh, learning what, you know, how to do things. But the reality is you're going to have to do the work. Um, you're going to have to do the back tests. You're going to have to write your trading plan and you're going to have to stick to your rules and, you know, a hundred percent compliance to your rules. Don't break your rules. Don't think something and do it. For me, if I take a trade because I think something's going on, that's gambling. If I take a trade because it is the same setup that I've had, you know, a hundred times over and over and over and over, uh, then I know 
um, then I know that I, ha I have a, you know, 67% chance, whatever the, the strategy is, I have a 67% chance of that uh, trade uh, making 2R or losing 1R. And so if I know that, I, it doesn't matter because if, if I lose, well, it's just part of the, you know, one third of the time that it's a losing trade or half the time that it's a losing trade. As long as I do my best to, um, so as I do my best to make sure that I'm implementing the trades exactly the way they should be, they were built in my back test, all the data says, as long as I do it correctly, it'll happen. If you think about it in the sense of, we got too many Europeans in here to do that. I was going to talk about American football, but <laughs> um, whatever, let's do it. I played semi-pro football, so it's a subject I'm pretty good with. Um, if, if, if we made a play and we practiced it over and over, uh, and everybody on the team knew the play, they practice it over and over. The coach calls in the, the trade and said, or the, the play and says, it's a, um, it's a red 44, red 44 tailback, something like that. Okay. So red will be on the right side. We're going to go through the four hole and it's going to be the tailback, the fourth running back um, or red 42 say whatever it is. Um, they call the play and the quarterback takes the ball, hands it off to the running back and he, the, the guard and the tackle move the off uh, the def defenders out of the way and the running back runs through and the first running back ahead of him blocker takes out the linebacker and the second one, second running back is looking to get three yards. Well, what if the quarterback instead called the play decided he wanted to do something. He's like, oh man, I really want to throw a touchdown today. And instead of telling everybody and practicing it and running an audible, he just says, you know, so huh, pulls back and goes to throw a touchdown where there's nobody running the, that play, you know, the, the likelihood of success or failure there is really low. Somebody, somebody on the team is, is going to have to figure out, oh, the quarterback, he didn't tell us this but he decided that maybe he's going to throw it and I'm just going to try to get open. Right. Everybody on the team's running the ball and he just decided to do that. You would, he would have to be the biggest amount of luck for somebody else on the team to realize the quarterback decided it. Now he didn't call an audible. He didn't make any changes. There was no indication that that's what he was going to do. He just did it on his own. And he, he said, ah, I think I want to throw a, a touchdown. That's the same thing of just looking at this and say, I think this is going up and then buying it. Or I think we're going down. I'm telling it. Nobody else on the team, team Chris here, Christy Macro, <laughs> nobody else in, in my trading environment, nobody on my desk with my hands, they're not, they're not prepared. If I see this setup right here, where are we at? If I see this and I say, oh, that looks like a short to me, well, that, then I'm not actually doing the work. Open above the overnight range. Uh, uh, so bulls take control, signal bullish breakout, confirm the bullish breakout, held the five-minute time filter. Okay, even though we've got these wicks, even though the market's up a bunch in the last week or two, even though it's a Thursday, even though, I don't know, uh, POTUS is talking something on TV, Jerry Powell is talking about something in, on CNBC or you know whatever, it doesn't matter. Well, that's my setup right here. So I buy that. If I shorted this and I got stopped out, that doesn't, that doesn't, that isn't just the normal, ah, oh, I got stopped out. It was a bad trade. I, you know, I missed the trade or whatever. No, I shorted for no reason. I shorted against the, the actual trade that I should have been doing. Now, if I bought here and it stopped out, well, that's okay. Again, it's just like playing football, running a play and not getting a touchdown or not getting, you know, moving the ball three yards. Right. It's, it's just, OK, well, on to the next one. Uh, you, you know, you don't uh, you don't like it doesn't ruin your day because it didn't work. It just, oh, OK, that that something else is happening. OK, wait for the next setup and you may not get another setup. Like, OK, well, I guess I'm done today. Walk away. Um, but you can see with these wicks right here where it was 
it could have very much been a cell setup. You know, if you're looking at that and you're seeing it and you're like, oh man, that, you know, that could definitely be a cell setup right here. Opening range, we're going to reverse because we're in a bear market and bear market sell off. That's what they tell me on TV. Um, but I didn't do it. I just followed my trading plan. Just, just the most important thing in the market. Nothing else matters. You want to know what matters in the market? Your trading plan and how you implement it. You want to know what doesn't matter? Jerome Powell, the FOMC, uh, the White House, uh, ECB. Uh, what else doesn't matter? George Soros, Goldman Sachs. Uh, what else doesn't matter? Uh, Citadel, market making. Um, Jim Cramer, doesn't matter. Uh, none of those things matter. Do, why would they matter to you? What on earth, what good reason would they matter to you at all? What do they, they don't, they don't matter at all. Because I'm, I'm here. Well, what's my job? I got to feed my family. I got to pay for the house. You know, I got to keep fuel in the, in the car. Uh, I got to keep food in the refrigerator. I got to keep the lights on. I got to keep, um, I got to keep the internet running. Uh, I got to make sure I'm fueling my body with good, good fuel. I got to make sure that I'm getting good sleep. I got to make sure that the air is clean. I got to make sure that, uh, you know, the Dexter has safety and has, you know, people looking after him and that he's, you know, learning and growing and thriving. Um, what else do I got to do? I got, I got to make sure that uh, my car is safe uh, for my family when we travel. I got to make sure that I uh, obey the rules of the road and I'm a pillar of the community. If there's something amiss in my neighborhood, I got to be, I got to see it. I got to take, I got to be uh, vigilant. Uh, there's older people in this neighborhood who can't take care of themselves. I got to watch after them. What the f does that have to do with the Fed raising or lowering interest rates? What the, you know, what does that have to do with the presidential election or congressional election? What does that have to do uh, with, yeah, what does it have to do with what Kramer thinks? What does it have to do with um, none of that? What all that has to do is I got to have enough money to be able to do those sort of things, survive that sort of thing. So that's why I have a system <clears throat> like, see that TV right there? There's no CNBC. There's no Bloomberg. I got a, you can't see it, but there's a computer over here with two monitors and it's got my swing trading on it. I've got, um, I've got the, uh, uh, I've got my tablet right there. Uh, what's, what is blasting out it? What audio is blasting out of it? It's just, you know, relaxation music. What's in my earphones? Um, nothing, nothing, nothing at all. Just, you know, uh, music. Um, none of that, none of that has to, uh, has anything to do with me uh, or all this stuff here is set up so that my environment is ideal for me to go out here, see this and take this trade and then see this and then add to the position and then see this and have my stop in place so that it doesn't go against me. Uh, so I don't have, uh, so I don't have a losing trade. So if I end up, you know, getting stopped out, I've made a couple bucks on the day, you know, <clears throat> and if I'm, uh, if I'm up, Let's see, 33, uh, if I'm up $9,000 this month already or in the last three weeks, um, then I've traded my plan and I am, that's where I'm at. So it, it probably end up being anywhere around 12 or 15 uh, this, this uh, to end the month, I think is probably where it's at. And that's pretty common for the size of the account that I run there. Uh, that's in addition to other accounts that I run. Um, that's just, that's just trading, right? I'm not, I'm not here telling you that I'm, uh, you know, that, that I'm shorting this because, you know, the market's going to zero and I'm the best trader. I'm not sitting. And, and also one, another thing I'm not telling you about is like, I'm not telling you that there's Lamborghinis in my garage. Cause there's not, there's a Tahoe. I drive a Tahoe. I don't need a Lamborghini. If <laughs> uh, you can, by the way, people get all caught up about uh, people leasing uh, their, their supercars. That's what you do. That's good financial. Uh, that's good finances. Like I wouldn't, I could go get, sure. I probably all of us could go get a, a Lamborghini it, you know, within a couple of years of trading like this. Um, I think they're, I think it's something like 2,500 bucks a month or something like that. Maybe it's, maybe it's more. Um, 
But if you're into those sort of things, then sure, go do it. But none of that has anything, you know, I'm definitely not the sort of person that would say, oh, you go pay cash for your Lamborghinis. You don't, <laughs> you definitely don't. If you got, you know, quarter million, $300,000 um, as a, uh, you know, $300,000, $500,000 to afford a Lamborghini, don't go buy a Lamborghini with it. Use that $500,000 to make more money trading uh, in the markets and, you know, stick with, uh, you know, stick with your strategies. Your trading plan is your business. Your trading plan is what makes you successful. If you can follow your trading plan and not try to get caught up into all the different things that are going on in the world um, and not try to get caught up in like, oh, you know what, there's, um, uh, the, you know, the Fed has, I don't know what's going on today. The Fed's going to do something. Uh, or, you know, what, what is NVIDIA's earnings going to do to the market? What's Snapchat's earnings going to do to the market tonight? What's uh, like all this information? Let's just have a look. What's on the docket? It's important to know sometimes that things are out there. Today, we had the GDP thing, right? Um, that came out. I already knew, uh, I already knew that it was, uh, that was what we had coming today. We got personal spending. It's not going to have too much of an impact uh, on us. So as far as economic information that's going to come in and F with the market, nothing, nothing interesting. Go to earnings. What do we have left? Alibaba, Broadcom, Costco. Uh, so uh, Alibaba came in and beat. Uh, Broadcom beat. Costco, they're probably expecting to beat. Dollar General beat. Dollar Tree beat. So you know, these are things that like Workday, I don't have to worry about. Uh, Hewlett Packer, I don't have to, like none of these do I have to worry about. So I've already, I already know that going into the day. Like yesterday, we have, we had the FOMC. I don't care what, what the FOMC said. I just knew that at 11 a.m. my time, the FOMC was going to release their minutes to their previous meeting. And that was going to have some volatility to the market. And most likely what was going to happen is nothing was going to happen until then. So I just kind of like hung out, got myself into when the system had a setup, you know, I got, uh, I'll show you yesterday. So this was yesterday, uh, yesterday on the open, closed above MR1, uh, bulls take control, signals a bullish breakout, held the time filter above MR2. So, and then it instantly started to pull back. So what I did was I waited for something to happen in here a reason for it to get bullish and bearish, knocked out, bearish, knocked out, bearish, knocked out. So I went over and I said, okay, when am I going to likely get an idea? Okay, Fibonacci, a good old friend who has nothing to do with uh, my trading, but a lot of people are paying attention to it. Overnight high, same area. Okay, so I just need to hang out at the overnight high, get long in here, uh, because we, we also knew that we were bullish and bullish on the day. So all the filters have held, so it's likely going to get back above and make a run up to the uh, up to there. So I did. So that's what I did. I just waited. I got long in here uh, as normal, and then I went for a walk like right here. And I had my stop in down here. It was a it was a low risk trade, a very small position trade. And by the time I got in on the day. Um, you know, I, I had a small winner on the day. It wasn't really that big a deal. I knew that yesterday was going to be that way. I ex my expectations of yesterday were very, very low. I wasn't trying to make any big money yesterday because I knew that everybody in the world was going to be focused on FOMC. So no trading was really going to happen. And I also knew that if I left it up to waiting till the FOMC, I wasn't going to be able to go for a walk. And so I, uh, I put more importance on that. Okay, uh, let's see what was happening. People are laughing about me. Uh, when there are profits, would you suggest to keep them in a prop account or withdraw? MF. Um, so uh, I don't take my money out of prop accounts unless I absolutely need them for, uh, for tax purposes. Because uh, every time you take money out, you pay capital gains tax on that. You can leave the money in the prop firm and uh, never pay taxes. So when I do, for example, for this house, um, I waited until January instead of December to withdraw the money for the house out of my prop account. I reached out to Maverick and I said, hey guys, 
uh, we're done traveling. We're done roaming the world. I'm, we're going to, uh, we're going to uh, uh, get a house in, in Arizona. Uh, so I need to pull some money out. And they're like, cool, how much? I you know, told them out and they said, okay, it'll be, uh, we'll do the wire right now. Uh, you'll have it probably tomorrow. Um, and had I done that in December, I would be paying taxes in April. This is in the United States. Um, but since I waited till January to do it, I was able to put that tax payment until the following year and you know, make that money back uh, and just leave it in uh, the account. So personally, that's what I do. Now, if you're, um, ideally, the other thing I would do is this would be part of your business plan, your trading plan, MF. Uh, big, um, big, uh, uh, big part of prop trading is writing your business plan. Again, I keep saying we got the course, this, this prop trading course coming out here in a few weeks. Uh, it's gonna be pretty low priced. Uh, so it should be very attainable for a lot of traders. Um, big focus is on the trading plan. And so for me, my trading plan says how much I need to, I need to make per month. And because I know what my expenses are. So if I'm going to take any money out of my account, unless there's another reason that is better than what I'm going to get out of the market. Like if it's some stupid reason, like I want to buy a Rolex, um, you know, I'll push that decision off for an extra six months. So I'll have, you know, whatever, a $15,000 Rolex say, Ooh, I love that Rolex. And it's, it's May. I'll say, okay, in November, I'll withdraw for that Rolex because I'm making a note that today my account balance is here. It's going to be 15,000. Well, I'm going to have, you know, $80,000 more or $100,000 more by then. So 15,000 is not going to be that. And I just put those decisions down the road. If I was to do something like that, I don't wear Rolexes. I got my pan right here. Um, I do like watches, but I only have two. I'm not a huge, you know, watch guy and all that sort of stuff. I'm not really flashy. Uh, but so if, if my expenses were $3,000 a month, I would probably pull $4,000 a month out because a thousand would have to go to taxes. Um, and then put that in an account in cash and then, uh, you know, pull that out. So if I made 5,000 this month, I'm keeping 1,000 in the prop account to grow. And one of the benefits of prop is you, you don't pay taxes until you withdraw. So you could stay with that prop firm, let's say 20 years, you know, you start out with a $50,000 account and within 20 years, you know, you've got a $50 million account, perhaps, as long as you're, you know, hitting your, 20 hour a month goal, boom, 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 steadily working your trading plan, only your trading plan. None of this. I think Kramer's going to do the, you know, talk about this stock. So I'm going to short it or, um, you know, like I, none of it, none of it freaking matters. You just have a trading plan. And I, I'm just in this world right here. This is my world. I don't care what the news is saying. I don't care what Zero Hedge is writing or what Real Vision is talking about or um, Daily Dirt Nap Jared Dude is talking about or, you know, none of it matters uh, there. Uh, uh, does working with you in the lab help fast track the prospect matter given your success with them, i.e. quicker scaling up? I think, no, 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 they, I, my, they may, they may think that they may say, oh, you've been working with Chris. Cool. Yeah, we're, uh, we like Chris. <laughs> Uh, but I have no, uh, I don't think so. I wouldn't do it if I was them. A prop firm is, uh, understand what a prop firm's, uh, motivation is. Um, a prop firm's motivation is to make steady, low risk returns for themselves and their investors. So, um, let's see, uh, I'll get to you. Uh, sorry. I got, I got a bunch of questions. I'll, I'll, I'll I'm getting to them. <laughs> Uh, so they're not motivated to scale you up. Now, I'll tell you this, they've got capital. They will scale you up. If you're the person that comes in and makes, you know, 5R a week, 3R a week, every week, 50%, 30% win rate, but you're keeping your losers low and you're hitting your winners, and it's just steady, 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 they're going to pour the money on you. And it's your job to just keep yourself going and scaling. Um, you know, you could be running a 20% or a $20 million prop account with an 80, 20 profit split, um, making, you know, five R a month, 10 R a month. Yeah. They're going to, they're going to 
they're going to fill that dude's account full. They're not going to fill the account of somebody who's going up 10% today, down 2% tomorrow, down 5% the next day, up 8%. That, that's just like this, but, but drifting higher. They're not going to give that guy a lot of money. If the dude's just like boom, 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 consistency, two days up, one day down, three days up, one day down, four days up, two days down, one no trade day, two no trade days, uh, five days up, three days down, but steady. Yeah, you're going to get all the funding you can. Uh, you're going to, every prop firm in the world is going to try to hire you. Okay. Uh, inverse Kramer ETF is what matters. <laughs> Don't forget, how about helping me keep my DGEN suppressed? I do help AK keep his DGEN suppressed. What have we been doing in crypto lately? Nothing. I got in at such a good price. I don't really pay attention. Uh, we got it. Oh, that's not true. Yesterday, uh, we got into uh, ETC USD. Uh, we got into Ave USD. Um, we got into uh, what else? Did, let me just for a quick week week long trade. Tron. Oh, over here. Uh, got into Tron yesterday. Uh, Tezos, XTZ, that's all right. XT, uh, TZ, USD. Just for a quick uh, week-long uh, position. And then Monero. Looks like it's not really doing all that well, but it hasn't really done much. And then pretty much I'm just staying in Bitcoin and, and Ethereum. Um, just staying there. Nothing, uh, not doing anything else. Uh, that's how I end up never driving my Ferrari. Uh, I'm sure you probably timed that statement really perfectly as, uh, and I missed it. So sorry, Jurg. Did Russell qualify as a reversal? Nope, not here. Once it, once it's done what it's done now, um, I'm, you know, this is the first pullback. So I'm expecting a pullback in the upper range. Uh, also looking at cumulative ticks staying up and Deval or Valdi staying up. Uh, what have I, uh, beautiful words of real wisdom. You're really an amazing person. I thank you, MF. I appreciate you. Should have bought one 25 years ago, a Ferrari or a Rolex. How much percent of capital would you recommend to funded traders? Percent of capital for risk per trade MF. If that's what you're asking, uh, depends on the firm you're with and their risk management. But, uh, the way I look at it is if I'm going to have 16 to 20, uh, trades, losing trades in a row, how, would I still be in, would I still keep my account? Uh, right. So if I, uh, so if I had 20 losing trades in, uh, and it also depends, right? So if you, if your drawdown is 4%, then you can risk uh, 0.25 or 0.20% risk on those because it'll take uh, at 0 0.20, it'll take uh, 20 losing trades in a row to blow up your account. Um, so for Apex, it's only two and a half percent. So I run 0.10% risk on that. So that's why a $300,000 count, one R is $300. Because for me, I wanna make sure that I know I'm gonna make you know, 30 R on a typical month, 20, 30, 40 R on a typical month. So, okay, at 0 0.20 risk on 30, uh, 0.20 through 30 R, uh, I'm sorry, 40 R, uh, you know, you're looking at um, uh, 300 times 30 is $9,000. Uh, and then it's $18,000 if I'm running 2R on an average month on my income on a $300,000 account. And you just scale it up. <clears throat> uh, answered that about the lab. For someone who's passionate of cars and doesn't do it to show off to people, do you think for a great trader, for a great trader trading of FTMO, is it possible to really afford one Lamborghini? Yeah, totally. So you, again, you're not looking to buy the Lamborghini. You want to lease the Lamborghini. And I think they're at about $5,000 a month. You're going to have to qualify. I don't know if it's going to be easy um, to qualify as a prop trader. Um, Loe, uh, as a LLC, you would want to form a uh, business and then be an employee of the business. Because when you take profits for, from your prop firm, uh, 
you're going to, uh, if you if you do take profits for risk management purposes, uh, you can write them off against business expenses, whereas an individual cannot. Ferrari, when you always had to leave money for making more gains and giving them back. Oh yeah, totally. Uh, well, I uh, just don't give them back. I have a solid trading strategy that doesn't give back the gains. How long does it typically take to make it through the test phase of Maverick before you begin trading the firm's capital? Three months. It really, um, it actually depends on how fast you do the back test. They require a hundred trade back tests uh, that you submit to them and then go through their process. A hundred trades I can do in a day on a back test. Most traders, it takes about three months for them to finish their uh, hundred trade back test uh, and submit it and then you know to go through coaching. But it's usually about three, three months before you do it. Um, but the, the great thing about Maverick uh, is if you have capital, they'll match it. So let's say you have a $100,000 account or a $25,000 account, you'll throw another 25,000 in there or they'll match the 25,000. <clears> And so now you have a hundred or a fifty thousand dollar account to trade, and then it's profit split. So you're making, you're squeezing out a little bit more money. Do you know something about the way Stevie Cohen day trades? I've always been interested, but never found nothing particular except his interview on Market Wizards. I, I, no, I don't. I reminded to ask because you named him at the beginning of the live. Yeah, there's. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure he's discretionary. Pretty sure he's a discretionary trader. I know a lot of what he, uh, you know, the black money, I think it's called, black edge, maybe. I don't know. Uh, but um, there's, a, there's a couple books on, on him, and it talks about, you know, insider trading. Uh, you know, he's big insider trading, but uh, that used to be the case. And he, he got prosecuted for it, and I think he settled with uh, Southern District New York on that one. Um, but uh, he also has a bunch of traders working for him. And yeah, I'm pretty sure he's discretionary. So there, it can be done, can be done. Uh, but you know what? There's actually a, a way to do it until you can get good at being discretionary. Most people are not going to get there. This is fun, guys. Like two hours plus right now. Um, I see we're definitely cutting, it, cutting the people off here. But I, I'm, I'm happy to keep answering questions. You got them. Discretionary, you know, I, I don't know what uh, pattern recognition is probably one of the best ways that um, that I would do it. How does the Russell look now? Uh, same as it did five minutes ago. How long did it take you to get into your groove? Um, yeah, like uh, price action chart formations, you know, so uh, a shooting star maybe, or, you know, certain candle formation, probably. I, I don't know. It's something that can be uh, something that you can make objective. And when you see it, you recognize that, okay, now this has happened. What would we want to do to make it, uh, you know, make it better? Um, Oh, no, I was saying that because it's at this yellow line, we're probably going to get some resistance here. But since we've uh, bulls took control, signal bulls breakout, confirmed bulls breakout, uh, and then closed above MR three and a half next, which extends the trend. So now this is the likely area of consolidation. Um, the next requirement for it is to close above MR five and a half and will reset the whole process. Signals a bullish breakout, confirms a bullish breakout. Uh, ex and then extends the trend. So, you know, $1,900 a day is potentially on the, a <laughs> uh, 1900 Russell day is potentially on the cards, but um, yeah, you know, it, at any of these pivot levels, you can find resistance. And as, as much as this moved, it, it's likely that that's resistance. Um, so it could just be sideways here. I'm keeping my eye on this. We're going sideways. We're still rising here, but it's side, sideways. So I'm, I, I, got, um, I got no reason to, to exit this trade just yet. And I'm certainly not going to short this trade later. Unless something really uh, bad happens. But 
Uh, I know about ICT. I don't know the methodology, but I have uh, a number of their traders went through uh, Maverick. And so they, they were solid traders. I like ICT. He's, he's a good dude. I don't, I don't know him personally, but uh, I couldn't, couldn't say. So um, I, I, I don't know, but uh, <laughs> there are a lot of people that follow me that follow him. <laughs> so, uh, and he's been around a lot longer than, uh, than a lot of other idiots. So um, I don't really see him posting anything about, uh, you know, like wacky calls. So I, I assume he's probably pretty decent. I moved my stop up. Yes. So stop break even is right here. So depending on what I end up doing, if I'm, uh, I'm either going to leave, put my stop there at break even plus one, or I'll leave the one R locked in and keep the stop at break even plus one on the second side for the whole thing. So, uh, I've locked in profits on this one for me. Um, I want to see how this does. That's what I trade at Maverick NM. Yeah. Um, right now it is. I put a I put a tweet out earlier this week. Um, I don't know what it was, but. Currently, um, is that it? Underfunded? Currently, the FVBO VBO strategy is in a sideways, in a, in a sideways, the equity curve is, I think I have a, Here it is. So historically, the FVBO uh, strategy goes through periods of, so this is futures. So it goes through periods of sideways, right? You can see we have a nice sideways range right here. Uh, we have another sideways range right here on the equity curve. Make it bigger. Um, maybe I'll, I'll draw too. Um, uh, okay, so we can see here, we had a sideways, here we had, oh, look at this guy all the way. Why is this guy, oh. I don't know why that one's in the way, but you can see here um, sideways and another sideways. That's the equity curve on the strategy. Right. So right here, and then a. So we're currently on the FVBO, right here, another sideways range. They typically last three to five months long, and uh, what's cool about them when you come out of them, they blast. So a couple of months, and then just straight takeoff. A couple of months, straight takeoff. A couple of months, straight takeoff. So right now, NM, the FVBO, VBO strategy on, um, on currencies, on FX, is in a sideways range. Uh, the only thing I've, that's really got going for it right now is, the, uh, is natural gas. Natural gas is in, like I'm up a, a nice runner on natural gas. Uh, but for the most part, it's just been like 0.5R, 0.10 winners. In this, in this environment, when I have a, a, a bit of a sideways in my equity curve, I am quick to run my stops up to break even and, and take profits at 0.5 or trail stop a lot quicker than when we get into the, the big breaks. You know, when you double your account size over the course of a, you know, six months or a year, go for three to six months sideways, kind of just like oh, 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 frustrating and then blam, it goes. I never know when it's going to end. I never know when I'm going to have a, a longer one. I never know when it's going to be a shorter one. Um, 
you know, it's just, it just, uh, it is what it is, but that's the strategy that I use with Maverick to swing trade end of day. And with, um, uh, uh, Lux, uh, let me turn off the annotate. Okay. Let's see how many R does your FEBO strategy make a month? Is that what you trade at Maverick? It is what I trade at Maverick. Um, on average, uh, it's about two to four R per week. So a little over a hundred and it, it's a, so the way it works is every 40 trades, let's say every, for 39 trades, I hit an average return of 1.2 or two R per trade. And then on the 40th trade, but it's not exactly the 40th trade, but every 40 trades or so, somewhere in there, I have a 5, 8, 10, 20, 30, 40 R winner. And so that happens uh, about, I think it's four to six times per year that actually happens, where I have a big, massive winner. So I'll take 40 trades, make an average about 1.5, 1.7 R on average. Uh, so you're looking at probably 60 R 50, 55, 60 R over the course of, you know, two months, three months worth of trading. And then one of them will be boom. I'll make, it'll take it from 60, let's say 50 R to 80 R or 70 R. And I'll do that again, four to six times a year. So, um, so it ends up being with Maverick and, and City, it ends up being around 150, 200 R on the year. Uh, if, if no big trades are caught, you're looking at 120 or 130 R on the year, which, which ends up being about 10 per month, I guess, at that range. Um, maybe, maybe it's a little more than that. Uh, why am I saying 10? Two to four, two to four, so four. Uh, two to five R per week. Yeah, I'm, I'm being conservative on that because uh, what happens is we go through these months, a couple of months of, of sideways and that's what keeps it around there. Um, Jurg, okay, is that the how the trading lab is every day or do you, do you do one with the members at the market opening and discuss the different setups, trades to take? Today's market opening... I said, good morning, team. The daily trend line in ES might uh, make for some hot action today. Russell has already defeated that trend line. No gap to trade this morning, so we're looking for breaks of the overnight highs or lows for a trend to emerge or a failure and a reversal. So basically, um, what it would be, what that was saying is, okay, you know, this was at 15 minutes before the open, so that was right here when I sent that out. We were at the overnight high. Um, so I was going to, basically I was saying, we're going to have to see how the open look works. If it blasts off, we're going to have a trend day. If it fails, we're going to short the reversal. That's what I said on the open. And then a reminder, today's live stream will be, will need to be registered. So that was that. I do that every morning, a quick overview of the trade of what I'm looking at on the open. If there is a, um, I, the, uh, if there is a, um, if there's an opening gap trade, uh, because, uh, sometimes there's an opening gap that can be traded. And last week there was a couple of them or two weeks ago, there was a couple of them, but it doesn't happen all the time. So I pretty much just watch how the overnight is doing. And, uh, we'll know if we're going to have an overnight, uh, or not. Um, and then, so that's what I did. And then typically, so that's six is the open here. Two hours later, we fire up the live stream like we're doing right now. So exactly what we did today. Uh, we do this every day. I record the live stream. I upload it to the, the Trading Lab member area. There's probably a thousand videos in there. Uh, in the Trading Lab, if you join the Trading Lab, uh, basically it's a Slack channel and a live stream every day. I, I put out all my trades every day, uh, whether I'm doing my end of day trades or the, uh, the, the day trades in the day. Um, and, uh, you had, uh, there's a whole course that's just for lab members. So the whole course is, you know, including all the other videos of live streams and everything. It's all about later NM, uh, it's all about, uh, 
it's it's all about um you know uh keeping the uh um keeping everybody on task not getting um not getting too caught up in it uh what's going on throughout the day mostly keeping people from being stupid and doing stupid things uh not i don't mean that bad to the traders in the lab that you know a lot of traders come in and they're like hey yeah i'm gonna do this and i need to you know i'm gonna because of the fed i'm doing this or you know i'm doing all these other things and a lot of what we do in there is keep people from you know ruining themselves in a in a bad market uh would it make sense to create the back test before applying a maverick i have never traded something like your bbof and bo but would need to reduce would need to to reduce vol i'll have to run through the pdf again yeah go for it um i i i don't know man uh if you're gonna go with maverick um you know tell them i sent you um i would probably do their they have a whole trading course so you can do their trading system or your own doesn't really doesn't really matter um do i ever look at volume no I mean, I use volume profile here, but I don't use regular volume. It doesn't give me, the only time it really gives me information is like on a huge reversal day um, or a reversal spike. That's really it, but I don't, I don't pay attention to it. So yeah, I don't pay attention to volume. Join the lab with my first profits. All right, uh, for all the interesting stuff, need to go look a bit after my little boy. Okay, enjoy. That's fun. That's the best time, isn't it, Jorg? Love it. Jurg. Cheers. All right, folks. I think I think we're coming to an end. Um that was a I mean two and a half hours. That was a that was a session. Ha. That's what we do. That's our uh that's our system, guys. Um look, I love you all for showing up. I'll uh, we'll send an email out with a link. I'll upload it to YouTube, share it out to everybody. We'll do these every month. So every next month we'll have another one. Um, hope you guys uh, hope you guys had a had a good time. Um, hope I was helpful. Uh, we'll do, Greg. You know, uh, I'll try to try to let everybody know when I'm traveling. Um, yeah, I don't know when we're in Santa Barbara. We we were actually planning on doing it next week instead of driving back to Arizona, but I was like, oh, it's an Airbnb in Santa Barbara. Come on, that's going to be 5,000 bucks for a week and it's going to be a little closet downtown. <laughs> you know, an 80-year-old closet. <laughs> Guys, I love you all. You're the best. Uh, June glooms in. I know. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't miss SoCal in June. I do not my old, my old hood. Love you guys. Bye.